So, hi everybody. I don't know if everybody knows me here. I'm Igor. Uh, I'm uh, part of the AngularJS team. And it's my honor to have Mark uh, from the Double Click uh, for Advertisers uh, team from New York here. Um, Mark is going to talk about uh, how they use AngularJS to build um, Double Click for Advertisers. Uh, it's actually called something else. He's going to explain it all. It's too complicated for me. Um, but they've been using Angular for, what is it, 18 months, a year and a half or so? Yeah. And they launched about a month ago. Speaking of launches, um, we actually launched a new. Can you switch back? We actually launched a new AngularJS application. Um, it's YouTube for Play 3. So the YouTube team in uh, San Bruno has been working on a, on a application for PS3 that will just give you access to uh, all the YouTube content. And uh, they launched today. So if you have PS3, you can go to the App Store and just download it and, and use it. It's all built with uh, AngularJS. Um, they've been working on this for, I want to say, 10 months or so. So it's great to, to see that launched. We're actually going to have uh, one of the team members from the team uh, come uh, to the meetup probably around October or so and talk about how they, how they did it. What they what they used and what challenges they faced and how they solved them. So that that's gonna be great. Um, I think that's everything I had to say. Mark, let's do it. All right. Hi everyone. How y'all doing tonight? Good. Good. Uh, my name is Mark Jacobs. I'm with Google. Uh, specifically, I am um, a uh, engineer and tech lead manager for a product called now called Double Click Digital Marketing Manager. Um, and we'll talk more about what that is. So what does this talk about? So about uh, in 2008, Google acquired DoubleClick. And the it's just this. Everything else is correct. Um, in 2008, Double Click, uh, Google acquired DoubleClick. And it inherited a lot of uh, tools and products and platforms that were done in a very different technology than is what you normally see at Google. Um, we were tasked about 18 months ago with rewriting from scratch uh, this product called DFA for Advertisers uh, and bringing it into a technology set that made a whole lot more sense within Google. Um, I'll talk a little bit about, more about it. Um, but essentially, um, this talk is, is about our experience. Uh, about what this product is, uh, what were some of the issues we faced, and some of the design decisions we made. And I'll talk a little bit more about as well about just how we have delivered this product. So the first thing to, uh, to point out is that uh, DFA is actually pretty big for an Angular uh, application. We actually think it is probably the largest application uh, built on AngularJS. Uh, just how big? It's about 200,000 lines of code. Uh, that is inclusive of views and tests and so forth, but still even controllers uh, we have in the number of like 90,000 lines of code. So it's a fairly large application. Um, as I mentioned, uh, I'm at Google. Uh, I specifically work on uh, DDMM trafficking front end, and I'll explain that a little bit later as well. All right, so what is this? Um, DDMM trafficking front end is uh, Google's buy side online display advertising platform for large advertisers and agencies. Um, I'll break that down a little bit. I won't spend too much time on it. Uh, anybody here in the advertising world? All right, so uh, the, the key, first key thing is, um, you know, the buy side represents advertisers, not publishers. Uh, advertisers are people like Nike and uh, Apple and so forth. Um, and uh, we're talking about online display advertising. So this is like banner advertising, uh, interstitials you might see on New York Times. This is not uh, video or, or social or search ads like AdWords. Um, trafficking is my particular realm of the world. Uh, it's part of the three main pillars of advertising, trafficking, serving, and reporting. Um, if you're interested in hearing more about that, I'm happy to talk about it after the talk. But in essence, uh, we're in charge of the trafficking side of things. All right, so the first thing you have to understand about where we uh, came from in order to understand where, where we ended up. So uh, DFA 6, which is the, the major version that's currently out for most customers, um, for, uh, it's the legacy version, as we call it. Um, it was built on C Sharp, uh, ASP.NET. Uh, its back end was uh, written in Java on JBoss. It was deployed 
on Windows in a legacy data center that's not at all like our Google data centers. Um, the data was stored in Oracle, as it says, um, and it's almost completely rendered server-side. So this is very foreign uh, to Google, and it's also very different from where we ended up. Um, again, about 18 months ago is when, uh, as a platform, we decided we finally needed to move to technologies that made more sense within Google. There's a lot of drivers for this. Uh, one of the key ones is there were all types of new features that we wanted to develop, and we needed something that had higher velocity uh, than, than we were cap currently capable of doing with uh, this technology set. Uh, there was also a lot of integrations we wanted to do with other teams at Google, and trying to figure out how to talk uh, .NET to some other service in Google is pretty difficult. Uh, another major uh, uh, problem was at Google, it's very difficult to hire .NET engineers. Um, they just they just don't walk in the front door, and uh, and so we knew that we had to grow our team by quite a bit uh, in order to build all what we wanted to build, and we needed to do it on a platform that allow us to uh, attract and retain the right engineers that could help us um, build this going forward. So. At this time, uh, again, 18 months ago, um, within our group in ads, the major question was, do we build this on GWT or not? Uh, GWT, if for those, how many people know what GWT is? OK. So we're talking about Google Web Toolkit. Um, and at ads, it was just fait accompli. At that particular time, uh, GWT was it. And everything in ads, if it was a new application or existing application or an extension of one, was written in GWT. Um, from my team's perspective, this was a little problematic. Uh, the first thing is, none of my team really had experience with GWT. Uh, we didn't really have any Java programmers. Uh, we were a mix of front-end JavaScript engineers and .NET folks. Um, and more than many of the other double-click teams that had switched to GWT uh, complained about it for various reasons. Um, I'm not going to go into a major comparison about what's GWT. Um, but the first major problem that was self-evident was um, it was difficult to find GWT engineers in the marketplace, just like it was difficult for Google to find, um, um, you know, engineers that were, um, you know, expert in, in, in .NET. It was challenging for us to find Java engineers that are truly UI engineers. Just because you know Java does not automatically make you a UI engineer. Um, so that was one of the the, the, uh, the factors that people complained about. They also complained about, um, you know, sort of difficulty in using the tool. It's kind of inflexibility. And it just didn't, uh, for my team, it just didn't match with our, with our particular skill set. So we looked at a number of different things at that time. Uh, we looked at things like Knockout and JavaScript MVC. We looked at doing plain closure. We looked at um, uh, uh, Backbone uh, JS. And at that time, uh, Mishko, who's one of the lead, you know, he's the TL uh, for AngularJS, um, had come to New York and was doing a tech talk on an early version of AngularJS. And we were actually pretty interested in what he had to say. And there was a number of different things that made it very attractive. Um, the first thing, okay. uh, the first thing is that AngularJS was a, a declarative solution. Uh, but what I mean by that is much of what the behavior of the application was captured in the markup. We could say things like ng-click, and uh, we do repeat. And that was in the markup, and it was pretty straightforward. Uh, another major sell for me was two-way data binding. At that time, there was a lot of uh, frameworks that uh, allow you to bind uh, UI from the models to the view, but not so many that did the reverse, so that when you entered data into an input, it actually updated the model. Um, it also used uh, plain old JavaScript objects. So again, some of these other platforms at the time, uh, other frameworks, require that you subclass this or wrap that. Um, I think it was Knockout in particular that has a really sophisticated dependency um, um, uh, detection framework between different properties, but it required you uh, to wrap all of your objects as dependency objects and things like that, which, again, if you come from the .NET world of Windows presentation framework, maybe that's familiar to you, um, but it really didn't make a lot of sense in a modern JavaScript world, at least for us. Um, as well, we had a lot of jQuery experience at the time, um, and we were excited to see that um, Angular had uh, a lot of jQuery opportunities for integration. Uh, Angular itself has a jQuery Lite uh, compatibility layer, um, and uh, you can use jQuery within widgets and directives. And uh, that seemed pretty attractive to us, because, we, again, we could apply some of our knowledge that we already had uh, into this particular framework. 
And I think one of the major things that, that blew me away uh, was there was a complete testing story. Uh, it was one of the few frameworks to really express a full culture of testing. Um, from you know the even back then, from the very first version, uh, there was uh, you know it, when you downloaded Angular Seed, it showed you how to write uh, uh, unit tests using Jasmine, how to run them using JS Test Driver. There was an end-to-end -end, uh, testing solution in Angular scenarios. This was all from you know the very beginning of Angular. And I think when you're trying to build, you know, uh, imagine how you're going to build a large application, having that testing culture embedded in your framework is really important. Um, and again, one other aspect that, is, that has grown up quite a bit um, in the last 18 months is just dependency injection and how that uh, fits into the testing story. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And lastly, uh, it has a straightforward architectural model. Uh, we can debate whether or not it's actually MVC. Uh, it's probably a mixture of MVP, MVVM, and everything else. Um, but uh, at least for us, it was pretty clear how to build walls around certain things to help the testing. Uh, the controllers, the WID directives, and so forth. Okay. So to get started with this, we decided to build a prototype. Uh, we took the main landing page of our application uh, in DFA6, which I'll, I'll demo in a few minutes, um, and we decided to reuse the existing web services, reuse the existing uh, CSS, mo much of the existing markup, and just see if we could angularize it. Um, this process took one engineer basically two days. And um, the payoff there was not only was it quick, but it ended up being about tenth of the size and about ten times faster. Um, nothing else we saw at that time really had the same uh, payoff. Uh, we had actually attempted to do the same type of uh, prototype using GWT. Uh, we worked on it for about two and a half weeks. And granted, we're not GWT experts. Uh, but we basically gave up because at two and a half weeks, we still had something that was partially working, but not completely. And we were already well done uh, with the Angular one. And we were quite happy with the results. So the initial strategy, again, DFA, which was seen a bit, is actually quite a large application. It has many different list pages and property pages in wizards uh, and different sections. Um, and our initial strategy was, given our, our success with the prototype, was to actually upgrade this large application page by page, view by view. So in place, users will be logging in, and then from one release to another, uh, an, another section will be lit up on the new technology, and they really wouldn't know, because it's it, just the same style, same, bar, but we'd actually have like pages that were operating faster and, and with less code, and those were written on the new stack, uh, and uh, while we, the old stack uh, was still being uh, essentially phased out. Uh, this actually worked pretty well. In fact, uh, last September, we launched uh, with this strategy, and it was very successful. Um, in other words, customers didn't notice other than when they were in this section, things seemed to be faster. Um, but as it turned out, uh, we, we didn't follow this strategy to now. We just relaunched, and uh, back at that time, we, uh, last September, we were looking at what we want to do for the whole platform. Essentially, this page-by-page -page upgrade was our strategy for upgrading the trafficking UI. But it really, in the end, wasn't a great strategy for upgrading the entire DoubleClick for Advertisers platform. When we started to look at all the things we wanted to do across that, uh, from trafficking to serving reporting, we decided, let's go from scratch. Fortunately, uh, Angular ha uh, in our architecture allowed us to just swap out a few key pieces, and we were able to save all of the work we had done from a page-by-page -page, uh, um, upgrade. So, as we kicked off the development for this, uh, many of you, if you work in enterprises, might be familiar with this. Um, this strategy actually created a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt, FUD, as uh, it's sometimes called. Um, the, there was a lot of reasons for this. I think one of them was um, we were not doing GWT. And we're in an organization where everything was GWT, and why are you guys zigging when everyone else has zagged? I think another major uh, reason for this was that the Angular team uh, is and has always been quite small. And I think from a, from a large revenue-oriented organization, depending on a framework that's maintained by two people, or now four or five or whatever it is, uh, seemed extremely risky. Um, and I think as well, uh, there was just a question about whether this, this was the right thing for ads. Um, as it turned out, uh, AngularJS is no longer a dirty word. During this period, we never even mentioned the word Angular. Uh, we just built it and said we're using a custom JavaScript framework. And then when, in September, when we launched, and, and everyone said, wow, this is awesome. How did you guys do this so quickly? 
oh, it's because we used Angular. And after that, it's been a total success. Across ads, uh, we've had many different projects uh, light up with Angular. Uh, new projects are, are generally considering Angular as our first choice. Um, Julie from uh, uh, Seattle over there is working on a project as well. It's built on uh, Angular. And this was truly inconceivable uh, when we got started. All right, so I'm going to give two demos. Uh, the first one is the old thing. Uh, it's DFA 6. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but at least gives you a bit of sort of before and after. Uh, and the second demo is going to be DFA 7, and I'll uh, demo a little bit about what our app does and some of the features it has. All right. So this is uh, DFA 6, and it is not pretty. Uh, it is not fast. It is written on ASP.NET, and while that's a successful stack for many people, it didn't really work that great for, um, for, for uh, DFA. But uh, as you can see, I'm sorry that it's cut off here in, uh, in uh, Mountain View, but um, we have three major sections of our application, campaigns, advertisers, uh, and an administrative section. Uh, you can think of DFA as basically forms over data. Um, our, our consumer is a trafficker who is trying to upload uh, artwork and generate all the custom metadata around um, how to build an online campaign. And we have objects like campaigns and advertisers uh, and placements, which represent uh, uh, areas on a publisher website, creatives, which represent the actual artwork and some data around that, ads, which represent targeting information. And so um, in this application, for example, I can go and look at a particular, uh, it doesn't actually make it better. It's cut off there, too. Well, I could do that. All right. Sure. Sorry about that. Um, so um, again, I, I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but essentially you've got um, you know long pages like this that show the properties you know of a campaign. Uh, we can see lists of objects. Uh, in this case, we're looking at at uh, creatives and creatives themselves. All these things have many different properties. Um, so. Um, this is the old version. So now let's take a look at the new version. So we weren't trying to radically change um, you know, the interactions, at least not at first. We were just trying to, A, make it much faster. Uh, we had um, a, a large effort in UX research and design to improve the usability of this application. We we're also trying to um, you know, just make it more consistent in, in look and feel. So again, across the top, we've got the same campaigns, advertisers, and admin. Um, I'll demo a few things uh, that I think are interesting from an AngularJS perspective. Uh, one is we wrote our own grid control. Um, and let's see. So this grid control has some nice properties. First, if I scroll down the page, uh, the headers actually stick across the top. Uh, another nice thing is if I, I can have many different columns, as, as I scroll, uh, it actually you know, has a sticky left-hand side. Um, if I go into like a particular campaign, sorry, this is all test data because I can't actually show you real customer data. Um, you see we've kind of cleaned up a lot of the, uh, the, the design. We've got some new controls. Uh, for example, let me see if I can find one. Uh, we have, oh, I know, hold on. Uh, another major control that we wrote is what we call an omni list. Um, and if I, for example, go to pull this up, it's a combo box with searching ability. Um, and it also has the ability to add new things, do multi-select. And there's a number of other things. For example, we also have the ability, uh, a little difficult to demo right now, that when two users are looking at the same object from different parts of the world, if one saves, the other one gets a notification. Hey, Mark just saved this object. Would you like to refresh it? And a number of other things. Um, all right, so I'm going to go back to the uncomfortable view for you guys because it actually looks correct on everyone else's screen. Um, all right, so let's talk a little bit about the architecture. Uh, the first key piece of this redesign was a redesign of the trafficking backend. So as we mentioned before, the DFA6 version stored data in Oracle, uh, had a SOAP API. Um, the new backend really was the driver for everything. It picked a new Google internal storage mechanism uh, and has a RPC uh, mechanism. Again, it's Google internal. Um, but it actually ha it has a compatibility layer that still exposed that SOAP API. 
So the big question for us is the, uh, yes. Yes. The question was if there was a jQuery in, uh, sorry? HTML5. HTML5 mixed. There were, were there was both HTML5 and jQuery on display there. Very subtle, but we'll, we'll hopefully get to dig into that a little bit. Um, so the first question we, we asked ourselves is, we have this backend service that has an RPC mechanism that you don't put right on the internet. So we needed some uh, intermediary to, trans, to basically allow the browsers to connect to this backend service. So what we wrote was a trafficking um, front-end REST API. Uh, this was a, a custom server written in Java uh, using Sun Jersey, uh, which is a REST framework. Uh, GSE, which is Google Servlet Engine, so there's like a, I think there's an equivalent uh, open source called Open Servlet Engine or something like that, uh, but it's basically just a, a servlet container, uh, and Juice, which is the dependency injection framework. Very simple, uh, supports things like, um, sorry, you can't see this, oops, um, it supports things like creating a new campaign via post, uh, getting a particular campaign, uh, you know, um, getting a list of campaigns, querying that, save it, that kind of thing. Um, its primary function um, is s several. One is authentication, um, aggregation of data sources, uh, simplification of uh, complex RPC. So, for example, our backend system, sometimes if you want to perform a batch operation on many different things, um, the REST API simplifies some of those interactions. So instead of being uh, 10 different calls to a backend, we can uh, package them up as one call uh, from the UI. And as well, it deals with transformation of data formats. Um, our backend service um, has sort of a, a compact binary representation that doesn't work on the internet. Uh, so we actually transform these things to JSON and, and decorate those JSON objects with many different things like self-links, uh, next and previous links. Um, and we also sometimes fold in um, related objects so that we don't have to do multiple calls. Uh, from the UI perspective, uh, we already knew we were using Angular, but there were still a lot of uh, design issues that we had to figure out. Um, one of the first ones is how do we deal with single page architecture? So this again, this is very different than the, the DFA6 version where you know, every page was rendered by the server. Um, in, uh, in the single page architecture, there's really two issues that we had to deal with. One was how do we deal with common view content? And the, other, the second one was bookmarkability. So common view content. So in, in our DFA6, we had this notion of nested master pages. So uh, if you go back to the app, you will see that, um, oops, sorry, uh, we have a header region up here um, with a shared uh, um, uh, menu that works across the entire application. But the next region down is actually only specific to the campaign section. And then furthermore, we've got a header, which is itself a subsection. So in DFA6, this would have been sort of nested views. Um, AngularJS doesn't really support nested views, so we need to figure out how to represent this. Um, and one of the things we learned was that directives were the key mechanism for reusability in uh, AngularJS. So we, did, we had to figure out what goes in index.html, that is what is going to be shared across the entire app. And this tended to be things like we have a warning we show when you're using an outdated browser or you, know, you don't have JavaScript enabled. We also put in index.html um, our notification area, like in Gmail, you get the little loading and, and uh, you know, item archive, that kind of stuff. But basically everything else is, is, is outside of index.html. When we want to get you know, the same header across multiple different pages in a section of the website, uh, we use a directive. That, and that directive wraps up not only the markup, but also the behavior around uh, that shared header. Um, around bookmarkability, again, the, in DFA6, we, there was no support at all for bookmarkability. It was, it, much of it was session-oriented, um, and you couldn't, in fact, in DFA6, uh, open two tabs uh, within the application. They would get very confused very quickly. Uh, so it, it was, the bookmarkability was a key design goal of DFA7. And so we had to lay out all of our URLs so that we can understand how you bookmark things. But we also had to figure out which state is bookmarkable, because not everything is bookmarkable. For example, um, if, I have, if I'm looking at a, uh, a properties page and I click a button and I get a dialogue, for us, dialogues are not bookmarkable state. 
uh, if you were to come, if you were to bookmark it while the, book, the dialog is open, you'd come back to the properties page or particular list results view th that existed before the dialog was, was popped up, not in the state with the dialog popped in. Um, we also uh, uh, tried, we, there's also other states, for example, um, uh, we have a feature called, oh, wait, I didn't demo, oh, I wish I should, uh, called Campaign Explorer, which is really like the, the, the new hotness uh, for, for DFA. Um, and in this feature, we have the ability to do bulk editing, and bulk editing is a mode. Um, so I can look at, for example, I can make a query that says, give me these 15 campaigns or 15 ads, and I can do bulk editing on that. Um, if I bookmark it while the, bu the, the bulk editor is open, um, I don't really want to, if I send you that uh, particular URL, I don't want you to end up in the editing mode. I just want you to see the same query results for those 15 objects. So there's a lot of these type of decisions that go into figuring out the bookmarkability of the site. Um, and one other aspect that, that, um, that comes up, for example, um, if I go into a particular campaign, um, I have this carousel thing uh, on the right. And this carousel is actually going through uh, the items of my query that, that from the list page I just came from. And so we had a big debate about, you know, is this a bookmarkable state or not? Um, and we came up with a hybrid solution, which was it's bookmarkable for the person who bookmarked it, uh, but if I send you that bookmark, you're not going to get all the carousel state, the ca you know, because that may not be meaningful for, to you to have that same list context around that object. So if I bookmark this and send it to you, in fact, we just strip off all the carousel data that's encoded in the location bar. Um, and so you can still see, you can still send a direct link to this particular campaign, but you won't get the carousel uh, because it may not be meaningful to you. You may not have the permissions to actually uh, rotate through that carousel um, and so forth. So this was a major design issue we had to think through. Uh, the next thing was uh, how we were going to use jQuery um, and uh, what was its purpose within the application um, and, and what limits would we put on its use. You know, the first thing that I think it's important to recognize is that um, while AngularJS um, has a jQuery-like uh, support and it supports, um, that work? Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, while AngularJS has a jQuery-like, you know, programming model for certain actions and supports being augmented with the real jQuery, um, it really isn't intended for general use, right? There's an Angular way of programming, and there's a jQuery way of programming. And the focus really is on using jQuery within directives. So we learned that lesson pretty quick. Um, and at first, we started bringing in a lot of jQuery UI, third-party controls, and other things like that. But over time, for various reasons, we, we chose to depend on jQuery a whole lot less. Um, one is uh, it just didn't seem as relevant. There was, we, uh, I'll talk on the ne uh, next slide. We use some other tools that have a lot of overlap with jQuery, and there's a more compelling reason to use those other tools. Uh, so we, we, we start depending on jQuery a, a lot less. Um, uh, and the less we uh, depended on it, the more we could see the light at the end of the tunnel where we wouldn't depend on it at all. We can just eliminate the overhead of jQuery. So as it stands, uh, we are trying to lessen our reliance on jQuery, and hopefully we'll get to an end state where, to the extent that we need it, we're using the Angular jQuery Lite um, or some other mechanism to do DOM manipulation. But right now, uh, jQuery is just used within directives to do DOM manipulation, some event work, um, and that's about it. Um, we don't use uh, much animation. Uh, what animation we do use, we try to keep it uh, limited to, I'm sorry, the question was, uh, was animations a consideration at all in our use of jQuery? Um, what animations we do use, we try to uh, use CSS3 transitions, um, because realistically the only target browser that doesn't support those is IE, uh, that we, that, uh, of our target browsers, is, is like IE8, and we just don't care. So if like, we get a degraded, um, uh, uh, experience on IE, as long as it's functional, I don't think it really cares. I mean, I think that's, um, it was an important design goal for us. Um, to the extent possible, we want to make sure everyone has equal access to functionality. But if, you know, you're working on a browser that doesn't support, you know, rounded corners or, um, or trans transitions or whatever, we're not going to do backflips. Um, just upgrade your browser and you'll be fine. Uh, so the other uh, consideration was um, what other tools 
and libraries that we already knew we liked, how would those fit into the architecture of um, uh, DFA? So one of the first things we, we just happen to love and we, we use a lot is underscore JS. Um, a lot of us have uh, on the team uh, really like a functional programming style and underscore.js um, supports all of that, maps, you know, folds, that kind of thing. Um, and as well, it has a lot of things like Google is, I mean, sorry, uh, you know, is number, is string, and uh, utility functions um, that were very handy. Um, the second thing that we use um, at first begrudgingly uh, was closure. So there's a lot of reasons we at first just wanted to stay away from closure. Um, one is it's very verbose. Uh, it's very different than other uh, frameworks. If you're coming from a jQuery background, Clojure just looks ugly. Um, but as time has gone on, we've actually depended more and more on Clojure for a handful of reasons. Um, one is Clojure plays very nicely with Clojure Compiler. Surprise, surprise. Um, and uh, we are heavily wedded to Clojure Compiler. We'll talk a little bit later. Um, and so that kind of played our hand a little bit. Um, as well, like uh, Clojure has... Uh, many different um, core utilities um, like Goog is string, Goog is number, that while there's overlap with jQuery and underscore, um, the Clojure versions have a benefit of the Clojure compiler actually understands those particular API calls and helps uh, it helps the compiler static analysis of your code. So when you say Goog.isString, um, not only are you detecting is it a string, but the closure compiler is saying, ah, I'm expecting after this you know, particular line is called that the thing you will be dealing with is a string. And it can actually use that to help with, with uh, you know, type detection uh, and other kinds of errors. So as in another reason we started using Clojure a whole lot more um, is within Google, one of the key ways of sharing um, you know, JavaScript controls across the entirety of Google is by wrapping them as Clojure widgets. Um, so we take those closure widgets, wrap them in Angular, and everything is just fine. So over the course of time, we've we've expanded the scope of Clojure. We still don't use any of Clojure's UI widgets or anything, but we use more and more of their libraries for things like messing with URLs, uh, date objects, doing fo uh, string formats, um, you know, and, and uh, some data structures and that kind of thing. Uh, another thing we added in the last couple quarters uh, is less. Um, anybody, how many people are familiar with less? So less is a CSS compiler, um, and Google has its own CSS compiler, like in every other company, I guess. Um, but we, a lot of us had already had experience with less. We liked the syntax. It was pretty easy to bring in. And the main benefit to us is we have a relatively large application and a large team that works uh, on different parts of the application. And over time, as we were trying to manage all these styles, one part of the app would get updated with the new UX design, and another part would sort of fall behind. And, or, or the UX designer would say, oh, we're updating the color for this, and we had to go and find all instances of that color. So the less uh, CSS compiler really uh, sped up our ability to quickly uh, uh, adapt to new UX designs and ensure consistency across the whole app. And as later on, we started to um, uh, uh, design uh, Angular controls that can be shared across multiple Angular projects at Google, the CSS compiler allowed us to easily construct um, a subset of our CSS that could be shared and packaged with just that control. Um, you know, the last, I think, key thing is uh, HTML5 boilerplate. Uh, I hope that all of you guys know about it and use it. It's a really kind of wonderful thing. Um, we don't use it for much. I mean, it basically defines our index.html. We definitely use it for its IE classes. So at the top, it basically says, you know, it defines, you know, .ie6 if you're using that browser, .ie8. Um, when we have to, you know, hammer... Uh, Internet Explorer into shape, we often use those those things. Um, other than that, I mean, the, the truth of the matter is uh, AngularJS is very compatible with a range of different tools and, uh, and libraries, um, and we haven't had to add that much. So uh, build, compilation, and minification. So um, the actual compilation and minification is done using Clojure Compiler. At Google, we have a build system. Um, and that build system has build files. They're, it's not make. It has its own name and its own you know, purpose. But essentially, we have uh, tasks that define that do several different things. Um, the first thing is it, it goes and compiles all of our, our JavaScript. Um, and it also does localization, which we'll talk about in a little bit later, um, and generates a deployment package uh, that we can then put directly you know, on the internet. So it's um, static stuff. Um, 
So uh, another key uh, question we had um, was how much uh, server-side uh, templating to use, if any. Uh, so the, the, the key design, I think, of Angular is um, you're know, really doing all of this client side. Uh, but there's some things you, you know, we would toy about um, you know, talking about if we would do them server-side. So in the beginning, up until very recently, uh, the entire application was all done uh, client-side. Nothing was rendered server-side. All of our files were static. Um, and there's a lot of benefits to this. Uh, one of them is uh, you can do static edge serving. So you know, we can take our entire you know, package of uh, you know, views, uh, CSS, images, and stuff, put them um, under a, an immutable version URL. So like you know, version you know, um, 2012, you know, uh, October, or something like that, and say that this, this package represents something that will never change. Um, and once you do that, you can actually set the cache expired to infinity. Um, and that's great. For, we, we have customers, um, you know, like in China, for example, that have relatively slow links uh, to Google. Um, and if we can put all of our static files on these edge servers and give them infinite cache expiry, that means unless we, we switch to a new version, uh, every time the, the customer brings that up, um, they have all the files already in their browser, except for that first load. Um, as time went on, though, we realized that there were certain functionality that we couldn't achieve without uh, server-side templating. So as of you know, our most current release, we've actually switched to rendering just our index.html. Um, we use a technology called Soy. I think publicly it's known as Closure Templates. Um, there really wasn't a sophisticated bake-off in that decision. It was just really easy to use, um, and we didn't really have um, um, difficult uh, requirements uh, for server-side templating. And what we use it for uh, is twofold. Um, one, um, we use it to drive authentication. So in our current, in our, before this release, um, the way we authenticated you, we served up index.html, um, regardless of whether you're authenticated or not. Um, and the app would boot up, and the very first time would say, you know, to the REST API, you know, who are you? Who am, who am I? Um, and if that REST API said, oh, you're not authenticated, it would return. You know, a, a forbidden, and then we redirect the whole app uh, into our login infrastructure. Uh, with server-side uh, rendering, we can eliminate that entire round trip. The index.html um, can know whether or not you're authenticated or not and immediately redirect you before even serving up the index.html. So that was a, va a vast improvement uh, to performance. Um, another thing is, um, in order for our application to work, we need to know what permissions you have, what features you're enabled for, um, you know, what, who you are, what's your username, what's your user ID, and a whole bunch of other things. Normally, that's just an additional round trip we do after the, you know, the page is loaded. Um, with our new mechanism, we just literally stream, um, slipstream that information into index.html. Uh, so that eliminates, it improves performance and eliminates a round trip. Uh, another reason is um, we, we have this need within large you know, uh, applications to be able to conditionally deliver different features. So for example, um, we have some uh, feature that uh, should be only enabled for a couple customers while they beta test it and then we roll the whole thing out. Or a better example is um, a feature is done, we're gonna roll it out to everybody, um, but we're not gonna roll it out on the same day that we push the, the deployment. For example, maybe the, there's a marketing event and they, you know, and they wanna do it on exactly October 1st. Uh, but we don't. We release on September, you know, 27th. So um, one of the things we need to figure out is how to conditionally launch these things after they're already deployed. Um, and the way we do that um, is uh, in server-side templating. Um, we embed all of your features and permissions in that index.html, um, and we've also done work to bundle portions of the application. So we can take an entire feature represented as a bundle or even a version bundle. So for example, we can say that this entire admin section, for example, represents a bundle. Um, and in index.html, we test whether you have that feature or not, and then conditionally include uh, instructions to load that bundle. And the bundle is views, CSS, images, that kind of thing. Um, now, once we have all this server-side templating, I don't think we plan to extend it past index.html, because we'd still like to take advantage of uh, the edge serving. Um, but server-side templating as well will help us with the edge serving by, um, by helping uh, inject the immutable version URLs required for, it, for uh, infinite cache expiry. Um, so third-party controls, um, 
These are things like, you know, your grid controls, your list controls, your date time controls and whatever. Um, we started with just a few, um, but as time has gone on, we, we've just used fewer and fewer. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, you know, one, we've trying to depend less on jQuery, and our initial batch of stuff was all jQuery UI oriented. We still got a few, like we have a date time widget that's based on jQuery UI. We hate it. We're trying to rewrite it right now. Um, uh, and as just time goes on, we're doing more and more stuff that's custom. I think one, it's it's very nice working within a complete Angular JS framework, having your own directives, um, you know, that are pure Angular. I think just works better and it works. You have more tight control over the performance of the application and how stuff flows up and down uh, scopes. Um, and some of our our controls were just we there's no we couldn't find anything on the market that did exactly what our UX designers wanted us to do. For example, our list and grid controls have a lot of complex interactions that you know yes we as Google could go out and shop around for this thing, but at a certain point it would just made more sense for us to develop it. Um, the few controls that we still use are generally internal controls for things like the, um, there's something called Google feedback. Uh, which is like, you know, you say give feedback and it takes a screenshot of a part of your app and you can complain to us and we'll get this in a big back end system. Um, we still use that. Um, and yes. Are you going to try and open source any of your Angular widgets? Um, I would love to. Um, and the I think the real question is not so much uh, whether or not, you know, the source code is shareable, um, but the real question is, what does a truly um, truly great third-party Angular control look like, and how is it deployed? And I think that's the question we've had. It's very difficult to solve. Um, even we've taken a lot of our controls, like these lists and grids, and, and just tried to share them um, across multiple Google projects. And we figured out how to do it to a certain extent, but it lacks the configurability that no one would normally expect of a true, you know, great, um, you know, grid control. Take like, you know, XJS or any of those really high quality grid controls. Um, we just don't know yet, and I say we, it's not just DFA. I don't think um, the Angular team itself really knows how you would, you know, write and, and distribute um, a high quality grid control that had all the configurability and themeability that people would expect. We just, I just don't know what that looks like yet. And so within Google, you know, we're sharing it mostly between projects that all have kind of the same look and feel. Um, but we'd love to figure out, as the time goes on, how we would actually package this thing in a way that more people can enjoy. All right, so uh, the other, another major uh, thing we spent a lot of time working on is internationalization. Um, and to how many people work on applications that are used in more than one country? Oh, good. Um, so as you guys know, uh, internationalization really falls into two separate uh, pieces. Uh, one is translation, um, which is relatively easy. And then the other one is um, localization, which at least for us turns out to be much harder. Um, so for translation, the way it works at, uh, in our project is we mark up anything that needs to be translated with a, a custom wiki-like link syntax that we created. So that's that we can see. Um, let me highlight this. Um, so it's basically you know bracket bracket, and then we have the, the string that's to be translated, and then there's a uh, vertical bar. You can see this right here, and everything after the vertical bar to the next bracket bracket uh, is an instruction to the translator. So you know it's oftentimes called the meaning, um, and the reason for this is because you know the same word could have, be translated differently depending on the context and, and, and what uh, things. So um, there was really no built-in mechanism to inside of Angular to support you know, uh, message extraction. So we ended up writing something custom. So what happens is when we um, do a build, um, all of these, our custom message extractor goes through looking for all things that look like this wiki link, link syntax. It extracts them all into a message bundle format. And it gets sent to an internal system um, that does, you know, that basically it's like a database. Um, and this database has a UI that our translators from around the world use to translate our application. So an individual message will appear in the database, a translator will go uh, enter in the translation, the translation will get approved. And then um, on the other side of our build, when we're actually building our um, JavaScript and our views, um, we load the translations for each locale that we support. And we we essentially compile these things. You know, we re-inject the translated term 
um, into the, the view or into the JavaScript, and we create a static locale-specific um, uh, version of that HTML file, that JavaScript file. So when you look at our deployment package, you know, we have um, you know, our, sort of, um, our, our, pub, our sort of shared folder um, has a subfolder for each locale. So we have an ENUS, ENUK, ES, and so forth. And in each one of those subfolders, you have you know, a full copy of the entire um, st set of static files. But those ones um, have translated terms in both the JavaScript and, and the views. And so how do we actually serve that? So when you log in to our application, we have, you, as a user profile setting, we know which locale you've selected. Um, and then we set a cookie uh, called XFA locale that says, oh, yeah, you're, you're the ENUS guy. And every subsequent time you, you request a static file, um, our static file servlet says, oh, you know, I'm getting a request from ENUS. I'm going to redirect to the subfolder called ENUS and just serve the file out of that subfolder. Um, and that's just the way it works. Uh, one second. The second part of internationalization is localization. And while this is not normally a hard problem, it turns out to be a little bit of a hard problem for us. And the reason is um, that DFA um, doesn't supports uh, several different locales the situation. So for example, um, I could be a trafficker sitting in New York. My client is in London, and we're talking about a campaign in Poland. And, um, and, so, and furthermore, like I could you know, be traveling between those different realms. So normally, if you're just localizing in a, in a client browser for either the, the um, invariant locale or the browser locale, life is easy. But we actually support situations where I could be sitting in New York and want to show things in a German locale, even though my browser and operating systems say you know, US. Um, and the uh, the reality is we don't we don't really support that th that well uh, currently and we're working with um, on several different tools. AngularJS has a bunch of tools. Closure has a bunch of tools to support all these different uh, you know variants of showing locales. Um, if you were doing a server side rendering, this would be much simpler. Um, but uh, another thing I, I don't mention here is we we support or will soon support the ability to um, uh, switch. Uh, between time zones. For again, to this, this this use case where if I'm in New York, somebody's in, you know my clients in London, and my campaigns in Poland. Um, I can bring up you know a page that shows when this ad is starting, when this campaign is, and I want to switch between time zones because I want to make sure that it starts at you know one in the afternoon you know in Poland, not one in the afternoon in London or New York. Um, and supporting that really meant that we had to figure out how to coordinate with the uh, server to properly render things in time zones other than my browser time zone. Or the you know the UTC, um, uh, and the last sort of major thing that we had to consider was how we were going to handle caching. On the good side, when you have a client um, side JavaScript application, you have a lot of flexibility of how you can do caching and where you can do it. Uh, so we do caching on the server. So for example, our REST API, um, whenever it makes requests to our backend, um, anything that's slowly changing, such as dimension data, so, you know. Um, you know, uh, the list of languages, the, the picker for different types, that's all cached in memory uh, in our REST API. Um, as well, we, we do a very conscientious use of HTTP caching. So every time we, um, you know, send a static file, we set a uh, expiry on it. Uh, depending on which environment you're in, we have a dev, QA, prod environment. Uh, we can set that anywhere between 0 and 24 hours. Um, there's also browser caching. So every time uh, you request like a RESTful endpoint that has JSON data sat, uh, attached to it, um, we can uh, we send uh, like a last modified since if modified since uh, as well as an e tag. Um, and the the REST API actually compares after it pulls down the data can detect whether or not it's changed. If the data hasn't changed, it just sends a not modified back to the client, uh, and we we reduce you know the the bandwidth to actually satisfy that request. As well, uh, inside of Angular, there's an HTTP service. Um, that does caching as, you know, as well. We do some, um, in our case, some um, uh, transformations on that data inside, on, inside that cache. Um, and finally, within the application itself, we do caching. Um, for example, like once we populate a drop down for a filter, we try not to reload it again once it's already loaded. 
Okay, so you know, how do we DFA uh, write and test code? First, let me talk about a little bit about our team. So in Google frame of reference, we're a medium-sized team. We've got, we're currently based in New York City. We've got about 14 um, software engineers, four test engineers, uh, four UX researchers and designers, um, and we're kind of lucky in that regard. Um, and one documentation writer, plus you know, a whole army of people you know, from product managers, uh, support folks, uh, localization project managers, um, and we often, to build anything, we need to work with other Google teams. So it's, a, it's, it's a definitely an operation that involves a lot of people. Um, the division of labor, um, I won't spend too much time on this, but essentially when features begin, generally speaking, we, our product managers write uh, PRDs, or, or product requirements documents. Those documents feed into the UX design process, uh, the user experience design process. They'll work on, on mocks while you know, negotiating with engineering as we're thinking through our design docs of how the feature can be implemented. There's a negotiation between uh, engineering UX um, as we figure out what's the right solution that balances technical reality and um, you know, artistic endeavor. Um, and then uh, out of that, we actually begin implementation. While implementation is getting started, not while it's ending, um, our test engineering organization works on test plans. Um, those test plans ultimately feed into product acceptance. So one of the things we do in our, on our team, we have twice a week uh, what we call bug hunts. Um, every engineer on the team, for twice a week, takes off their developer hat, puts on their test hat, and um, is randomly assigned a test plan and does manual testing uh, on that feature. Um, this is in addition to our automated test coverage. We have, as I'll talk about, 99% uh, plus uh, automated test coverage. Um, but automated unit tests in particular don't cover everything. So we try, and the bug hunts not only give our team a chance to test more of the application, but also to build familiarity. When you've got 14 uh, engineers, they generally, they, they built this feature. They may have little awareness, if at all, of another feature built by somebody on another part of the team. So the bug hunts build uh, general knowledge for, uh, for the entire product. Um, so as far as development environments, uh, we ha do not have a team standard, and this kind of sucks. Um, we've got people working on Eclipse, uh, IntelliJ, WebStorm. We've got folks who are doing text editors like Sublime, TextMate. Myself, it's Vim. Um, and you know, working with in a, in a browser window. And the reality is, this is kind of a, a crappy situation. Uh, we'd love to be able to um, at least have a recommended IDE. It's fine if people want to do their own thing, but we've had a, a lot of growth on our team recently. And one number one complaint I hear from um, you know the new folks that join our team is like, I wish you would just give us like a recommended platform. It's fine if I deviate from it later, but you know when you're just starting on a project, you know you're trying to learn so much about the code and the business, and whatever. Why do I also have to figure out? You know which development environment works and how to configure it. Um, you know, and, the, and the, the shame at this point is we don't really have a great thing to suggest. They're, they all have their pluses and minuses, and I think this is an area that you know we need to work on um, both you know our team as well as uh, is Google. Um, automated testing. Um, so there's a combination of um, unit automated unit testing as well as integration testing. Um, all of our unit tests are written in the Angular suggested way. Uh, using Jasmine um, to write our unit tests. We currently use JS Test Driver to run our tests. Um, JS Test Driver was the Angular approach from you know, the dawn of time, but that's changing. And it's changing for very good reasons. I think that um, JS Test Driver is flaky, um, not as performant to some other choices. And now we've got things like um, uh, Testacular, which, which kind of takes that JS Test Driver model and puts it in uh, over Node, and it's a little bit more, um, a lot more reliable and faster. Um, we've also looked at other uh, methods. There's some other groups at Google who are using AngularJS with some other test mechanisms. There's something called GJS Test, which is you can find in code.google.com, um, which runs uh, um, those unit tests not in a remote browser, but actually locally uh, in V8. And there's some other approaches as well. Um, and ultimately, the only thing we care about is how can we run our tests as quickly as possible uh, for test-driven development. We'd love to be able to hit save, and you know, a quarter of a second later, our 1,600 tests uh, would just magically run. Uh, in reality, it doesn't quite work that way. Um, I also think that uh, some of the problems that we've had with JS Test Driver are symptoms of having a lot of tests. I think this worked much better 
when you know we had 200 tests, 400 tests, but now that we're in the thousands of tests, um, you know we, we need to examine some other ways of doing it. But still, the one benefit of this model is when you do run tests, you can run them simultaneously on multiple browsers. Our um, automated unit tests are run on pre-submit, so every time we attempt to submit code, uh, the full unit test suite is run on, on our internal cloud, and if any of those tests fails, it refuses to submit, which is pretty cool. Uh, we have in our own internal um, code coverage tool um, you know, that tells us, oh, yes, the, you know, these four files are all perfect uh, in, you know, of this particular change list, but this one file has only 60% you know, coverage, and it's these three methods that need to be uh, tested. Um, like I said, we, we maintain over 99% unit test coverage. Um, our integration test story is not as wonderful. Um, uh, we've had uh, historically a lot of um, desire to use AngularJS scenarios, um, but not a lot of success um, in using it. it um, has anybody used uh, Angular scenarios in the room? Okay, then you don't feel my pain. Um, but end-to-end uh, -end tests are very important, right, because they, unit tests, you know, uh, validate your application up to a point, but ultimately you need to know, all right, if the person, user clicks on this button, do they see, like, this next route, or, or if I create a bunch of objects through the UI over here, do they actually appear in the list? Uh, unit tests don't really, uh, are not intended to go that far. Um, ultimately, what we've settled on is we use, we write our, our integration tests uh, in Java and use a technology called WebDriver, uh, which is, again, it's open, uh, you know, on the web. Um, and this is okay. Uh, the, the main problem with this scenario is I have an army of JavaScript engineers, and JavaScript engineers are supposed to write their own integration tests. And when my integration tests are written in Java, you know, and using WebDriver, there's, there's a disconnect there. There's an impedance mismatch. So we're trying to work on how we can write that and look at different approaches other than Angular scenarios um, that will move that responsibility back into my, my team's camp. Um, Okay, so uh, just looking back um, at our experience with uh, AngularJS, um, there are advantages and disadvantages. I think some of the key advantages are, you know, first and foremost, uh, it leverages, um, you know, standard web technologies. You know, when I go out and try to grow my team, um, you know, it's nice to be able to know that I can bring in people that have already had exposure to the tech stack, you know, not necessarily specifically AngularJS, but they have exposure to HTML5, CSS3, um, uh, uh, and other related, you know, modern, you know, JavaScript, the good parts. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, advantages to this. Um, I think as well, you know, for the same reason, we're able to bring in people and get them up to speed quickly. They still have to learn our business uh, and our object model and our code base, but at least they're not struggling as much with, like, learning GWT, for example. Um, another thing that we, you know, we've learned to love is that, you know, testing is deeply embedded in the Angular way. Um, from the very beginning, um, you know, Angular, you know, shows you how to not only run tests, but how, how to help model your code such that it becomes testable. And I think, you know, as, again, as you're growing teams or trying to bring on new people, having that, that model be self-evident within your project code base helps a lot uh, in making sure you've got quality code. Um, the velocity of development has been really good. I don't think we could have done as much as we've, as we've done without Angular. Um, certainly, if, if I think it's reasonable to say, like, if we were doing this on GWT, um, we would not have gotten as far. We have some other projects in our platform who have done GWT, and they've been reasonably su successful. They were, they were more experienced GWT developers than us, um, but they've basically gotten to a point where uh, UX engineers or UX designers are telling them, all right, now build this grid control. Now build this, you know, list control. And there's, like, we don't have the time. It would take us months and months to do what it took us only you know, a, um, a milestone or two. Um, I think another key thing is um, AngularJS just has a really passionate team. Uh, and you look at, um, you know, the, uh, the community building up around uh, AngularJS, that's in large part, you know, because like Igor and Mishko and Voita have just been a gr doing a great job at outreach and being passionate about, you know, a better way of coding. And that goes a long way um, in, you know, being passionate about your own code. Uh, and of course, you know, the fact that so many of you are here for an AngularJS meetup is a testament to the community that's building up around this technology. Um, when we were using it, nobody was using it. <laughs> um, and I think even, even as much as, like, you know, two, three quarters ago, um, you know, I could keep track of Angular, you know, mailing lists. I could actually, like, maybe respond to. Now, it's like I blink and there's, like, 400, um, you know, requests on there. And, and um, I think that community is really starting to 
um, sharpen us all in different approaches uh, for using Angular. Uh, some disadvantages, uh, I guess if you used AngularJS, you may be aware of these. Uh, the first one, like AngularJS scenarios, as I mentioned, uh, it's pretty much ignored. Uh, it's not well documented. Um, and uh, we even had like personalized training from you know the AngularJS team. And it just never, like, it, it, we just, it, it has a very um, high conceptual hurdle to use it very well. And, you know, my goal was to get my entire team writing integration tests, and it just never took. Um, so that could be definitely improved. Um, you know, you, when it comes to unit testing, um, there's the, you know, Angular it does an excellent job, at, like I said, of, you know, embedding unit testing in the culture of development. But one thing that isn't as well, uh, isn't as sharp right now at least, um, is the specific testing technology to be used. Um, again, in history it was JS test driver. Um, going forward it's, it's testacular. But right now we're kind of in flux uh, between those different technologies and you know, Angular Seed hasn't been completely updated and the way it works inside of Google versus outside of Google is very different. Um, so this is, yeah. So there, there's a pull request actually to uh, replace uh, JS test driver and testacular uh, with testacular and Angular Seed. So that's going to happen this week. And uh, the plan is to get rid of JS test driver in anywhere we use it this month. So cool. Just testacular is going to be the way forward. Excellent. Um, and the final thing, um, you know, it's disadvantage is that the Angular JS documentation is imperfect. Um, it's, you know, I, th I think a lot of the automated documentation around, you know, this class and this method, or whatever, is pretty good. Um, but it's missing a lot of key conceptual content, and sometimes the links between them, you know, aren't that great. There isn't a book you can get by um, that says, you know, give me, you know, Angular from the ground up. Um, and I think um, as time has gone on, as I'll mention here, um, you know, Angular has gotten much more flexible and powerful, but it's also gotten a lot more complex. Um, has anybody here uh, used Angular like over a year ago? All right. One hand. <laughs> That's impressive. <laughs> um, Angular, when we started, was actually much simpler. Um, and simpler, but also more confining and more constraining. Um, and I think that, you know, it, uh, Igor blames me and my team for this. But oh, as time has gone on, we just kind of, um, you know, exerted pressure on the envelope of what Angular has been capable of. And the AngularJS team has really responded to that task by, you know, bringing in uh, more sophisticated, you know, dependency injection, um, you know, modules, uh, a whole bunch of, you know, uh, you know, the widgets and directives used to be separate things. Now they're one thing. And there's been a whole bunch of changes. Um, um, and the end result is, like, being um, a, starting a brand new Angular project today, I think, requires a lot more understanding and a lot more um, conceptual uh, hurdles than it once did uh, if you were doing this a year ago. Um, again, I think that it's because Angular is a stronger project, but it definitely is a barrier of entry. Um, dependency injection. Um, I think dependency injection is awesome. Um, but is if you are the average, I think, JavaScript engineer probably hasn't had a lot of reason to use it and certainly hasn't had a lot of reason to use it inside a JavaScript application. Um, if you are a Java uh, uh, application developer who's done Juice, um, you know, uh, Angular's JS's, you know, uh, DI implementation is just like Juice, but not everyone who comes to Angular JS is going to have that experience. And I think, you know, it's one thing if you know, dependency injection was kind of optional or was, uh, it was a recommended practice, but it's pretty much front and center with AngularJS. Um, and I think what that means is, you know, when you are bringing new engineers uh, to AngularJS projects, you're going to have to make sure that they understand uh, what DI is and how it's used. Why, why do you think dependency injection is awesome? Um, well, it's kind of hard to imagine how you would test something without, you know, test a, a limited component without subbing out, um, you know, related functionality. So, for example, um, you know, I want to test, you know, a, you know, the class, um, uh, you know, a particular um, UI widget, um, you know, that normally like loads data from some external resource. Well, when I'm running a test, I don't actually want to go out and talk to a server, you know, connect to that data. That would make my, you know, one minute test run like, you know, all take all day. Um, so using dependency injection, I can say, all right, in this particular instance, I want to use you know, a different service or a different thing. Maybe it's a mock. Maybe it's a you know different flavor. Um, as well, you know, sometimes I might want to uh, you know take a component, and it can have different flavors of behavior depending on which instance it's in. 
using dependency injection, I can say, you know, okay, I want you, you know, in this particular instance to use this service that maybe connects to, you know, a campaigns, you know, a, a trafficking backend. But in this instance, I want you to talk to a, a reporting backend. Uh, so dependency injection allows you to, um, you know, postpone some of those, you know, connectivity decisions to the last possible moment when they're actually instantiated. Do, do you also see uh, benefits from better, better structure and better composability of your application and creating these components? Uh, do you see that in a larger application like DoubleClick? Yeah, I mean, the, those two things kind of come hand in hand. I mean, um, you, know, you know, the whole point is I, I want to make components that have the smallest possible test area so that they're easily testable. For, you know, so just because I'm ultimately going to take a piece of data and put it on a web page doesn't mean I want to test that component by interacting with the DOM. I want to test it as close to um, you know, its interface as possible. Um, and I think that you know, breaking the application into, into uh, you know, a constellation of small, small different components that can be individually tested and then composing them um, with a, you know, sometimes with mocks, sometimes with the real thing, um, helps uh, you know, speed development. Um, you know, another reality of, of AngularJS, you know, it doesn't attempt to solve all the key problems in large-scale web application design. Um, you know, it doesn't even try. I mean, there's a lot of things you're still going to have to solve, uh, you know, for scalability and performance. And, you know, one of the things that my team's been struggling with recently is, you know, we have a, a one feature um, that essentially collapses. It's like a redesign of our application. We, you know, there's one part of our app that's, you know, 10 different tabs and, and as many different property pages. And we're collapsing that into a single unified experience. And one of the struggles we have is now we've got this sort of monolithic controller that's like 3,000 lines. And we're trying to figure out how do we actually you know, decompose that into something that makes a whole lot more sense, pushing things out to models, writing custom resources that, that, that do a little bit more of the, uh, the, the heavy lifting. Um, so you, you know, AngularJS doesn't have any solutions for you for that, uh, at least not yet. Um, and the last thing, you know, mixing uh, client server-side templating uh, can be very messy. And as yet, you know, I don't think AngularJS or really, you know, any of the major frameworks out there uh, do anything to help you with this. Um, and I think that's going to be, you know, something that's going to be unavoidable uh, in the years, in the months to come, uh, you know, trying to figure out how exactly we're going to mix, you know, those two um, uh, rendering strategies. Um, any questions? Yes. So we start off with Gwit, and then we started looking at Dart. But what we really wanted to focus on was HTML5, and we saw AngularJS as probably the easiest integration between HTML5 uh, compared to Gwit and Dart. Uh, what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, the our, our goal was definitely to have an application that was fluent in HTML5 that that they could take advantage of CSS. Three and um, you know the, the nice thing about AngularJS is that it really doesn't much care whether you're using HTML4 or 5. It doesn't um, you know there's obviously uh, some new features you can add if you if it supports HTML5 such as you know better routes in, in the location bar and um, you know but for the most part AngularJS kind of gets out of your way. As as a sort of a side example, um, we just started working on some data visualization. Um, we wanted to show like stream graphs and other things about our campaigns, and we decided to use AngularJS to generate SVG, right? And we we're actually building up visualizations by doing ng repeats and binds and stuff on SVG. Um, and the key point is that AngularJS is really agnostic to which form of markup you could use it on XML, you could use it on HTML5, um, and it really doesn't care. And as far as the HTML portions of HTML5 that don't deal with markup, like you know the various different you know, f you know, history, API, and all those things. Um, I, you know, again, I think uh, AngularJS has a clear programming model of how to wrap things as services, how to deal with persistent state, and, um, you know, it just nicely gets out of your way. Whereas I think so with something like GWT, you have to, you know, write sort of native, uh, you know, JS code wrappers for all that stuff, and it's just kind of ugly. Um, so, you know, the fact that AngularJS is just no is nothing more than JavaScript, uh, it kind of gets out of the way, I think, is a huge boon. If you want to do HTML5 and Dart, it, it gets pretty painful. From uh, I'm I'm asking that's that was our experience. What do you, did you guys look at Dart? Uh, we did not. It, I mean, it didn't. When we started this project, it didn't really exist. Um, and um, you know, I I have yeah, I don't love Dart, but uh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh. Um. 
Oh, wait, I'm going to get hit the guy in the back first and then... Cool. Um, Sorry. So two quick questions. Uh, you mentioned you, that you have about 200,000 lines of code now. Yep. Uh, can you share, is the code bigger or smaller now that you switched to AngularJS? It's much smaller. Oh. Um, so again, that 200,000 lines of code incorporates um, you know, our HTML that has um, you know, uh, Angular markup in it and incorporates our test. I mean, essentially, if you look at just the, the JavaScript code, it's about 96,000 lines. Um, our the DFA 6 version, um, you know, was, uh, I want to say it was around 350,000 lines of C-sharp code, not including all of the ASP.NET templates and whatever. Um, and uh, I think ultimately we, with, with Angular, we have, um, you know, uh, much smaller code that is, I think, much faster and easier to understand. And second question, uh, you mentioned a couple of times that the desire to get rid of uh, jQuery. Mm -hmm. Uh, is that is there any other motivation other than the file size? Well, ultimately, it's a bit of overhead that that we may not need. Uh, you know, it is. I don't know. How, does anybody off the head know? It's like 76k, or or it's it's relatively large. Um, and ultimately, we're just using less and less of it over time. I mean, a lot of jQuery's weight uh, comes from supporting browsers we don't support. Um, it has a lot of functionality that we just no longer can use because we're confined to using jQuery only within directives. Um, we're not doing a lot of the types of, you know, uh, of heavy lifting that jQuery is famous for. We're just not programming in that way anymore. Um, and when we do need certain, you know, utility functions and things like that, um, there's other things that we already have to include in our projects, such as closure, closure that it just doesn't make much sense anymore. Um, you know, within an Angular context to really keep depending on jQuery. Okay. Hi. Hi. Uh, just uh, if, imagine you have like unlimited time, unlimited human resources, and let's say you don't have to support Internet Explorer. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, which framework or which technology would you pick to rewrite the double click? Um, like JavaScript, Angular, Backbone, Backbone. What else do we have? Pure MVC, uh, Knockout. Pick where you I'm saying even with the benefit of hindsight, I still think we would pick um, Angular. I think the one thing that would be very different if we started the application today is that um, you know our application you know matured at the same pace as Angular. So when we started you know figuring out how we're going to write DFA. You know, these guys were figuring out how to write Angular JS, um, and what that meant was, you know, we paid an upgrade price every time they got a new idea, um, and every time they figured out, oh, there's a better way of doing this. Um, you know, fortunately, these guys helped us a lot. Um, if we were to start all over again today, I think our code would be a lot cleaner, a lot more concise. I think we'd make better use uh, of a lot of, of a lot of the features, but I still think we'd use Angular JS. I, mean, I think that um, you know, some of these other technologies like Backbone has picked up you know quite a bit. Um, but it's a different programming model that I don't think is necessarily better. Uh, I don't think it's worse. But, uh, it's much more JavaScript-oriented versus markup-oriented. Um, I think that the only real thing we crave, and I think this is like for a lot of people, um, is maybe a uh, you know programming framework that was better at going back and forth between client and server. Um, you know, but I think that nobody's got this figured out yet. And as soon as we have somebody who does, they'll be in a good good position. Web sockets plugging. Can you tell us a bit more about your development life, uh, development cycle? Mm -hmm. Because you just mentioned that uh, once every two weeks, developers take off their hat, developer hats and put on testers hats. Yeah. But what else? What do you have? Okay, so um, we use an agile methodology. Um, uh, which method we use really depends on the makeup of the team. So. Um, you know, when the team was young, um, we tend to use fairly strict Scrum. Um, nowadays, we tend to, to go more towards the uh, XP. I mean, as a um, person, I, I, you know, I've been a um, uh, Agile Scrum certified trainer and a bunch. Um, you know, my belief is that these particular methodologies should adapt to the realities of the team. Um, if you've got a team that needs structure, well, then less you know, use structure. But if you got a, 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 an experienced, mature team that can figure their own things out, I don't need to be chasing after them with, uh, you know, product backlogs and stuff like that. I just need to provide the over-level vision. Um, we currently work on two-week sprints. 
So we still keep that you know basic rhythm. And we have two sprints per milestone. So you know milestones represent kind of like the product manager vision. Um, you know what we want to deliver. You know in, every month, uh, and we have two opportunities uh, within that the, within that month to deliver a new piece of code. We have a major and a minor version. One that delivers a bunch of new features. The other one that you know fixes those features. And uh, <laughs> uh, the question is within is that within a month or it, it's actually we have two. You know it, we have two. Each sprint has a production deployment. Um, but the intent is the second production employment for that in that milestone is intentionally minor. It's really just you know bug fixes or, or other kinds of things. Sometimes we don't even do that second production deployment. Um, within each sprint we have or milestone we have an over level uh, you know higher level planning session uh, where we try to figure out at Google it actually works at multiple different levels. We have this thing called OKRs, objectives and key results, that sort of define what a, what a team or a platform is going to do over the course of a quarter. And then within that we figure out, okay, what are we going to do in each milestone? We've got three milestones for that, uh, you know, that particular, by the way, not every team works this way. This is how my team works. Um, you know, we have three milestones within that quarter. Within that quarter, we then break the work up into multiple sprints. Um, the team, you know, again, I, my team is actually uh, matured quite a bit uh, since I first started working with them. And we don't have uh, a very strong scrum process because basically they don't need it. Um, you know, so I define what are the high level uh, you know, goals for um, you know, the milestone, suggest a split of work between you know, first and second sprint, and the team basically says, all right, I'll pick that up, uh, you pick that up, and, and they take care of it. Um, the, you know, we've got, um, within that, in that sprint, we have, um, like I said, we, we do uh, bug hunts twice a week, not twice, not every two weeks, but actually, you know, two times per week, Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, and then we have an acceptance period at the end of each sprint and, and where we do a full-blown, um, you know, testing pass, both automated and manual, uh, in coordination with our integration testing team that looks not just at trafficking component, but across serving and reporting as well. Um, acceptance is, is a dual level thing. Our team has, accepts it through these bug hunts, and then we have the product management team actually accept it for uh, an official release. Um, did you want, I have more detail if you oh. want it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. As someone who's starting with AngularJS, you said that you would rewrite the code, a lot of the code, make it a lot cleaner um, on your second write. Could you give us some, uh, some of your benefits that you've learned? Um, as we're going forward, like just, you know, if you can help out a little bit. Um, there's a lot of things. Um, I think that um, two that come to mind. Um, one is this notion of scope control or separation. Uh, so if you, if you wrote an application that's older than, you know, six months or so, um, the scope and the controller were one and the same thing. Um, which seemed weird when we started doing it, but, you know, who we just accepted it and moved along. Um, and then at some point they made, you know, the decision uh, that really the controller and the scope, you know, that is what I would call from a um, WPF perspective, the view model, are in fact separate things. Um, and in fact, even before they did that, we were, we were working on trying to figure out how do we expose the view model off the controller um, so that we can do all different kinds of interactions. So we were already kind of, you know, imagining that. If I were doing it today, of course, we, you know, most, much of our app does not yet have scope controller separation, and it's kind of a pain in the butt. And we would, if we were to do that again, we would definitely um, separate those two. Um, I think another thing is I talked a little bit earlier about sort of the the danger of writing monolithic features. Um, you know, the the when I was working with my team, you know, early on, I think there was a lot of resistance to giving model objects behavior. They should just be dumb, you know, um, you know, serialization objects, um, which is fine, but it's not really how MVC is supposed to work. Um, and I think that, or at least many different forms of MVC. And I think as time has moved on, we, we kind of, as a team, convinced ourselves, yeah, you know, it really is a good idea to move behavior into your models, move more logic outside your controllers. I mean, the, the classical controller is really nothing more than a wiring mechanism. Uh, that simply says, okay, when I do this, call this method on this service or this, you know, th uh, this model. Um, and I think that that you know, if we were to do it all over again, we'd make that more of a clear um, design rule and keep our controllers much more trim than they currently are. Um, that, those are the two things that come to mind. 
Do we have questions in San Francisco or in Seattle? We cannot hear you, Julie. She's passing okay. the mic. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Uh, this is from Seattle. Um, I have a question about NG Show. So I was, this is an issue I, was, I ran into earlier today. Um, is it possible to do an NG Show on something, I guess, doing a conditional within that, um, that directive? So for example, if I have NG Show pizza, but I want to show only pizzas that are pepperoni, if that makes yep. any sense. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that the goal there is you need to expose some, you know, method or property on there that, that actually uh, represents the condition that you want. Um, you know, one of, the nice, uh, one of the nice things, you know, about uh, a lot of these JavaScript objects is you can just extend them with the behavior you want. So, um, you know, maybe you have, if you have polymorphic pizzas, um, you know, they could have a type discriminator and you're basically doing ng show on that particular, you know, that particular property, not really on just the whole object. That Fair answer. Yeah, sounds good. Like that's what ng show is supposed to do. It's supposed to conditionally hide things uh, based on some property or some some method call uh, on a model. So, okay. in short, for ng show to work, you just need to externalize the state that you actually want to drive, whether you show or hide something, not just kind of make it, you know, indirect. I see. Okay. And another question: um, Is there another method to learn Angular better, like more in depth, other than the, um, like the guide and the tutorial? or the documentation that's currently available on the site? Yes, you can come out and be an indentured servant to the AngularJS team. For <laughs> <laughs> um, so th there are several videos on YouTube. If you go to youtube.com slash AngularJS, uh, there are several videos and tutorials uh, that cover more stuff than you could see in the tutorial. Um, we are posting um, Brian, I don't know if Brian's here, but Brian Ford, uh, he's blogging a lot about AngularJS. Uh, if you if you just search, uh, if you look, if you know JavaScript Weekly, he makes it probably to JavaScript Weekly uh, every every week. Uh, and uh, he was blogging about D3 integration and um, using Jade and Node.js and all kinds of stuff. So uh, there are many resources. Uh, if you want to keep track of them, I suggest that you subscribe to our, our Google Plus and Twitter. Um, pages and uh, we usually retweet these things that we find very useful. Um, so that's probably the best way to keep up. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to add one thing to that, which is that I've also found actually picking a couple functions and reading through the Angular code can be very helpful. <laughs> um, like maybe looking at like how the injector works was super helpful for me. Yeah, yeah, that, that's uh, people. People say that that. They look at the Angular code and they find m many idioms that they didn't know about. Uh, and you know, the, the code is open source, so please read the Angular code. And it's fairly well documented, so it should be easy to for you to understand what's going on there. Um, and lastly, uh, the meetups. Um, um, it, in these meetups, one of the purposes why we are here is to just meet you and give you opportunity to ask questions. So you know, come to meetups, uh, ask, bring questions, make a list before. And just you know, ask us stuff. We are trying to cover every month something interesting. So like uh, in September, we're going to be talking about directives, and we're just going to do a deep dive into how directives work and how to make the best use of them. So if you want to know about directives, come in September, and and we'll talk about that. And I, there's just I have one key piece of advice to anybody new to Angular. Uh, on my team, when I have somebody new, we talk about the Angular way, um, and the Angular way is kind of a, a, a mindset of how Angular works. So the key idea is, if you're coming from a jQuery world, you're used to reaching out to the DOM and pushing changes, much more of a presenter type thing, right? Where um, you know, I, I'm, the, I'm the controller and I, I'm uh, doing everything. Um, in Angular, the Angular way is represent all of your state in models and just set up the bindings, right? So your view basically says, you know, when this, you know, this property is true, you know, then I'll show myself or then I'll hide myself. And the key point is when you want to change the view, when you change the appearance of the application, you change the models. You don't change the view. Um, and I think that's the key conceptual hurdle of using something like you know, AngularJS or any real MVC thing successfully. So what's the best place to get these kind of questions, like architecture, not necessarily small technical details, but architecture or even what's the best way to do things? What's the best form online to... Besides the, the meetup, which is only like every few weeks. 
Um, I mean, I'm sure uh, Igor has more to say about this, but I can think right. of a couple things. I mean, one is, um, you know, AngularJS is, in fact, you know, resting on a foundation of technologies that came before. So reading about, you know, MVC and MVP and MVVM, um, just, you know, those patterns as a whole will help a lot. I also think for the dependency injection, reading all the information online about Juice is incredibly helpful. And as well, like, there's a, a massive community building around Angular uh, that's on Stack Overflow, that's on, uh, you know, the Google Groups list. Um, and there's some, like, really sharp people uh, on that list who seem to know as much as any of us uh, right now, uh, even though they're not part of Google. So uh, that would be my suggestion. More general questions on the list and specific and Stack Overflow, you'd say? Or? I think on the list, uh, you'll find that uh, beginning with a JS fiddle or some other kind of concrete problem will get you much better responses. Just saying, like, well, how do I write a good Angular JS application is not going to get you as far. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, but there's, there's always a gradient of questions. You've got like very specifics, like this thing doesn't work in my case, but there's always like you want to start right some, yep. in some cases. And what about um, feature requests? Mm -hmm. Is there a place or yeah? A we have an issue tracker on GitHub, and that's the best way to. GitHub is the best one. Yeah. Okay. Very great. Thank you. Um, so you said that you uh, like to do test-driven development and that uh, if you got your way, then you just, every time you save, you'd run all your tests and everything would be awesome. But I think you mentioned that you don't get to do exactly that. So I was wondering, like, wh uh, how do you get around that problem? I mean, I'm assuming it just takes too long to run them. Yep. Um, so, like, what do you guys do to make sure that everything's still green other than I mean, maybe you just do the, the commit thing, but what else do you do? I mean, there's a, there's a number of different things we do. Uh, one is, uh, you know, the, the uh, Angular version of Jasmine uh, has things like dDescribe and iit that let you limit the scope of which tests will be run. So if I know I'm working on this particular part of the application, I might put a dDescribe around that block of tests. And so the only thing that are actually running are, you know, 20 tests versus 2,000 tests. Um, so that's one thing. Um, the other thing is, and I'm embarrassed to say this, but many people on my team just, just kind of like abandon test-driven development, um, you know, in day-to-day -day because they just can't uh, can't do it. I can't tell how many times I've, I've just get, had this face when my team tells me, yeah, I, I wrote the feature, now I'm going to write the test. Well, you know, in large part that is a struggle with uh, – that's a result of several different things. One, we can we can blame it partially on the tools. It does take too long to run some of these tests. Um, but as well, like if you if you're an engineer working on a new platform and a new thing, you know it's really hard to write the tests first. You need to like wrestle with the code and wrestle with even to understand what you're testing and, and what is a component. And and so I think that you know since my team has grown so much, we've had a lot of people that they just can't begin on this platform with test-driven development. Something you arrive to. Um, and as much as that offends my personal sensibilities, it's just a reality that we have to work with. Um, I also think that uh, you know, we continue to look into, into solutions for how to speed this up, um, whether that's testacular or, or other approaches. And then finally, even if we write the test after the fact, we, 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 we do in fact wait the however many minutes, you know, several times per hour you know, to run all the tests. And we, we're not allowed to check things in unless the tests pass. So there's many fail safes. Uh, but I would love if, if like running tasks were, you know, gave you running tests gave you immediate feedback. Um, and it really was just a blink after a save. So I, I have to add to this that I, I learned that they were having this problem just like three or four days ago when we were preparing the presentation. I was shocked and horrified that it takes so long to run the test suite. And they haven't said anything. So like when you see problems like this, tell us because it's, it's something that they're doing wrong. I don't know what we set up a session and we're going to figure out why is it taking so long for them to run tests. Angular itself has uh, 1,600 tests, so the test fit is comparable. The the, the way we do, we wrote tests is probably slightly different. I don't know. We need to figure out what is different. But our test suite, uh, comparable size, it takes two to four seconds to execute uh, on modern browsers on a you know developer machine. So we need to figure out what's going on and fix that because that's our tests are probably a bit more DOM-centric than yours yeah, are. So that, that contributes at least some of the differential, but we do need right. to dig into why. Wait, uh, I think it's fixable, so we're just going to look into it. And do it. Over here? Over here? Do we have any remote questions? 
<laughs> too dark in San Francisco. <laughs> too dark everybody's sleeping in San Francisco. <laughs> so we'll take a local question. Okay. Um, have you looked at your at DFA and Angular on tablets? Is that a consideration at all? Or? Uh, yes, I would love to do it. Um, we don't do it because our customers are not doing it. Uh, and again, it's sort of a circular argument. Um, you know, we look at our Google Analytics. You know, there's like maybe 0.6% have actually attempted to run it in, in uh, you know, a tablet. Um, well, I'm sorry. And and the, the where where it really manifests itself is in the negotiations we have with our UX design team because they have all kinds of like, oh, when you hover over this or link over this and whatever, and we say, well, that's not going to work with a finger. Um, and they go, well, we don't care because that's not what our customers do. Like, it's hard to imagine, you know, a trafficker actually like doing this on a beach, you know, with a tablet. But um, <laughs> like, I, I feel like all these applications should just work uh, in those environments, and we shouldn't make stupid design decisions that that expect, um, you know, a, a mouse. But you know, I haven't won that argument yet. Okay, I, and I would just counter the saying that I wonder if the reporting part of it would would actually be useful on a tablet. If it worked on a tablet, you know, yep. uh, because and in fact, we, we, we do our reporting side of it, uh, not our trafficking side, does have um, some support for working on an iPhone. Like they have a, a mobile view where you can get like high level details. But it's kind of a separate product, right? Because you're not looking for the same amount of data on a small four inch screen than you would be on a 30 inch desktop. So I just want to add to that that uh, while DFA doesn't use, uh, doesn't build the application for tablet, um, there, there are other companies that, that do. Uh, I just uh, read a really good blog post that was uh, written yesterday uh, from goodmovies.com, I think. Good movies. Uh, and they were describing. Films. Sorry? Good films. Good films? Good films. Uh, and, and they were. The, this, this guy was describing in really great detail about how they build a mobile application with AngularJS, how they use directives to do all the touch and stuff that you'd expect on a mobile device. So uh, look at that Twitter stream or Google Plus stream, and you'll find this stuff there. Can we have um, a question from San Francisco? Sure, let's do it. Yeah, go ahead. Wait down. How you doing? I'm wondering if you. Uh, <laughs> it's really dark there, but. <laughs> I'm wondering if go you on. guys have taken a look at the uh, the list of recent frameworks, like for example Meteor. I know you talked about Backbone and a couple of other ones, but are you, um, well, I guess to make it simple, how would you compare Meteor and Angular? So Meteor is trying to solve many, many problems uh, that Angular doesn't, doesn't try to solve uh, right now, so the scope is much wider. Um, it also doesn't try to be a production solution today. Uh, you know, there are many things that they still need to work out in order to make it a, pro a solution that can be um, deployed in production. It's very interesting, especially the communication between the client and server, the way they solve it is interesting. I don't think their templating is as strong as what we can do with AngularJS. So uh, going forward, what would be interesting for me is to see if Angular could be the front end for MeteorJS. Meteor JS would just do the communication with mm. the server, all the server side. Good answer, thanks. We have another question in Seattle. Okay, let's go on. I was just wondering if you have anything in terms of key bindings and gestures and how they interact with the models. Any kind of uh, ideas around that? Uh, in uh, DFA, in the double click, or? Yes. <laughs> this, is, you, this is a design question about how we uh, deal with gestures. Is that what you're, you're talking about? Yeah, gestures and, and key bindings and how people tab around your, your controls. Yeah, so stuff. we have no explicit support whatsoever for gestures at this point, and that, that's related to the previous question. We, you know, our, our UX engineers are just not focused on, on supporting, you know, tablets and, and uh, iPhones. Um, as soon as we get some kind of you know, uh, product management direction to do that, we may invest more. Um, key bindings, on the other hand, we have um, the, uh, an upcoming feature where we're going to support a lot of the same key bindings as in Gmail. Uh, you know, JK gets you through the things, enters, opens one, and that kind of stuff. Uh, but that's not implemented yet. All right. Um, how often do you update 
to the latest version of the Angular framework? And then what type of update pains do you have and how long does it take? So the answer used to be as infrequently as possible. <laughs> uh, the answer nowadays is every time they update it. Because uh, essentially we, our internal build system uses the latest version of the code for any component that we depend on. So whenever they update that component, we automatically get the update for, for good or bad. Uh, generally speaking, though, if they, if they were to screw up, they'd, they'd hear it from a lot of people quite immediately. Uh, you know, Previously, though, we, we did update uh, slowly. And it got to the point where it became very painful because we were on the 0.9 branch, not 0.9, the 0.7 branch. 0.9 and 0.10. So th this was yeah. before 1.0. Before 1.0, there were many breaking changes. And that's why they were lagging behind because with a large application like, like DoubleClick, it takes a while to refactor it and you know, resolve the break. Now that we are past 1.0, the APS is stable and it's much easier for them to just be on the latest and just get all the updates we push. You guys have pinky sweared never to break anything ever again, right? <laughs> <laughs> no comment on that. <laughs> okay, San Francisco is waking up. Uh, can I ask one more thing? Um, I've heard a couple of times that we need to figure out the angular way to achieve things. I'm fairly new to it, so my question is, what is your suggested mechanism to achieve code reuse between controllers? Between controllers? So yes. I think that the, the uh, this goes to um, the desire to sort of reduce um, the chance of monolithic applications. I think to the greatest extent, if you can move logic out of the controllers into models or services or custom resources, um, you're much better off. Um, you make the controllers as thin as possible. Um, in our case, we actually do have, um, <laughs> and I don't like this, but we actually have a full-blown object hierarchy of controllers. So we've got a base controller and a base edit controller and a base, uh, you know, and, and they all do use inheritance, uh, you know, classical inheritance through uh, Google Closure. Um, in retrospect, I would not have done that the same way. Uh, it's, it's turned out to be very painful um, to kind of upgrade things. Uh, if I were to choose this going forward, I'd either, again, move the code out into um, you know, models and services or use mix-ins um, to get the same kind of shared behavior between controllers. Thanks. Okay. Um, in your experience, um, when is it good to use directives and when is it not good to use directives? That's like asking when is it good to use your hand and when is it not. I mean, it's like <laughs> I don't, I can't imagine a Angular app without directives. Um, basically, directives. Well, sorry, I meant when is it good to write your own directives? I didn't oh, mean, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I mean, when it, when is it useful to write your own directives and extends that could not do that? I mean, the unfortunate reality we're in right now is that there isn't a, you know, a massive shared you know, code base of you know, directives beyond AngularJS, you know, themselves. And so it's not like I can go search and find, oh, you know, here's, you know, 14 different versions of the same directive and I can pick and choose which one has the best, you know, code coverage. So in many cases, we're writing custom directives all the time just because there's no other choice. Um, but, you know, in general, um, you know, writing directives is just a key piece of how you write Angular applications. The, pur the, the purpose of a directive is basically it is how you communicate with the DOM. All DOM communication happens in a, in a directive. It's, you know, if you want to do any DOM manipulation at all, it, you either have to use an AngularJS directive, write your own, or find someone that does it. So, you know, it's, it's the, the, you know, the, the nexus for all of that communication, you know, with the view. Um, related question, do you mainly stick to um, attribute type directives? Or are you actually writing, uh, you know, element type directives? So um, this fantastic ability you have right now of you know, being able to, you know, write your directives in four different ways was actually our feature request. Because um, I got totally annoyed that every time I, I, I use Vim and use Syntactic and it complains Syntastic that it complains every time I save it and like I don't recognize what uh, you know ng colon show is I don't have you know support for namespaces and this so you know one of the things we wanted to make sure is that that our HTML could validate um, and the only way to do that is if there was you know other ways of representing these things so right currently right now we do everything as data dash you know DFA dash something um, and that's our path to, to validation. You don't use any element. Uh, directives. Nope, they're all gone. We converted them all. 
how do you use uh, how do you use uh, backbone models uh, views uh, in parallel with uh, uh, with the models that you have here? You mentioned in your slides that you both you use them at the same time. No, we don't. Um, I mean, we we examined using backbone back in the day. Okay. Uh, we don't use backbone currently. Now it makes um, sense. So you don't use it in parallel. No. Do we have any remote questions? Any other local questions? No one here? Uh, I'll do a question. Go ahead. Um, so you're saying when you're rewriting an app, one of the first things you could do is just modify the, um, the views separately. Just make them so um, if you have two things that are connected, you can bind data to a particular, like, like let's say, an input box, like in the, like in the examples. So you would do yep. that first. Um, but if you're creating a new app, uh, you think it's if you let's say like you're like me and you just product you started using Angular last week, you're just prototyping things. Um, would you think it's it's good to just continue using jQuery a little bit here and there as as, I, as you prototype and then come up like for come up with a way to um, write a directive afterwards or um, how would you how would you approach creating a new application if you're used to like the jQuery way? I would say that you need to divorce yourself from using jQuery as soon as possible. And I'm not saying this because I don't think that jQuery UI development is, isn't valid, but it's just not valid at all within an Angular JS application. I had a uh, uh, an engineer, a contractor came in to, to develop a, a feature, and he kind of wrote this feature kind of half Angular, half jQuery, um, and it worked. jQuery UI. Uh, no, jQuery. I mean, he was he, he was actually mixing... He was breaking the Angular rule, uh, and he was doing uh, some uh, DOM manipulation outside of directives, and, and or doing it in directives, but in a, in a kind of incorrect way. Um, and, it, and it ultimately worked, but it was a dead end. Like there was no way of converting that code into something that was actually correct within the Angular way. Um, it was just a complete, you know, bastardization of everything Angular JS intended. Um, and so I would say that you know you need to understand that directives are where you house all DOM manipulation, and you need to really abandon if you want an Angular JS application to work and be you know uh, evolvable, you just need to you know abandon that style of development and, and just focus on, on the Angular way. So what were the problems? Was it reusability, or was it test coverage, or all of the above? Uh, like I mean, there there were things he was doing like. Um, Yes, he, the guy also wrote no unit tests, <laughs> and, and I think that also was was you know allowed him to get further into this you know particular solution than than uh, than he would have normally. Um, I also think that like you know like when for example we updated our um, our grid control, and because he was doing so much outward jQuery DOM manipulation, uh, he assumed so much that he couldn't really just swap out one widget for another. Um, there's a whole, you know, uh, host of problems. Um, and again, it, it, it worked, but it, it, we could not evolve it into something we could integrate um, into our project. And by the way, this was just a learning project for the guy, so it's not like he got fired or anything like that. <laughs> it was just that, you know, in in his you know path to understanding Angular, he went, you know, in this you know left veering direction, and you know it, it just turned out to be a dead end. So. When you say divorce yourself from jQuery, do you actually mean that just scope all the jQuery work or, or confine it within a directive? That's exactly what I mean. Okay. Um, I, I don't mean like you need to abandon uh, jQuery along with all your hope. Um, I just simply mean that like it, you know if you're used to, to uh, jQuery being the mechanism to do everything in a J, uh, app, you need to really recognize that there are boundaries to doing that within an Angular JS application. They're limited to directives, and many of the things you used to do with, with you know, uh, jQuery are just not going to be as relevant anymore with an Angular JS app. Hi. So um, I used to do a lot of, I, I still do a lot of jQuery, and I also wrote a couple a little Angular JS apps. So the different, the key difference between Angular and jQuery is that in jQuery you're more of a manipulating, like to say, presentation, and you're operating on events. Like something happened, someone clicked the button, then you do uh, some logic, then update the DOM. When you're going to write a fairly large and medium-sized application, you'll sooner or later realize you need some sort of a State, state management, and it's probably going to be some sort of object that will have something like uh, state dot window open true, 
or panel open number a number of open panels equals to one. So what AngularJS does, it gives you it gives you this state state uh, management uh, in the form of model and takes care of everything else. So it takes care of um, model state being reflected in presentation on your HTML page. So in that, that's the key difference between developing in like a, developing for Angular and for jQuery. Oh, that's it. I think that's exactly right. Just to, to restate it one way that, um, as I said earlier, the way you change UI state in Angular is you modify the model. The way you change it in jQuery is you trap some event and then go out and change the view. Um, and those two models are not compatible. Can I ask? Can I ask a quick follow-up? Um, sure. So what I what I use Angular what I use Angular for is um, well, it's, let, let's you create a bingo card. The user types in words and it automatically um, converts it to an array and fills up um, you know dynamically like as the user types fills up the bingo card with the words. So it's so it's great for that. So so what I use, just you know, started reverted back to using jQuery 4 was to do to launch a modal dialog. So I guess I'll just uh, ask you. Since you have some experience with doing modal dialogues, what are your some what are some of your um, best practices for that? Because I know you also talked about that earlier. Thank you. All right. So um, in our case, um, we we have a service uh, that represents a dialogue, right? And the the function of that service um, is is non-visual. Like you basically just simply say, hey this is the moment when I want to show a dialog, and here's some information I want to get back from it. And then that service interacts with a dialog widget, which in our case temporarily uh, wraps uh, jQuery UI's dialog. Um, and so that, that widget sort of lies in wait for the service to, to set a, you know, a property saying, oh, a dialog should be showing right now. And that, wi that, that widget is constantly waiting. Can I show now? Can I show now? Uh, and as soon as that happens, it shows. Um, and then you hit OK, and essentially what that widget does is write that state back to the service, and then now the calling controller can simply say, oh, you know, it, it, there's been a scope event that, you know, that says there's data to retrieve from that service. So it, it's a level of indirection. You have services work, you know, a standard pattern I see all the time in Angular is a service working in concert with a, with a directive. Um, and again, that's because the service is where you want to represent shared state across controllers, and directives is where you want to manipulate DOM. And so you need to have these two things working in tandem to get it all to work correctly. Another question in San Francisco here. So my question is around code reuse. Um, in my company, we've been using Node.js for over a year now, and we got really comfortable with the require system, the common JS system for modular, modularizing code. And recently, with Angular, we've been using a bit of a build tool called Browserify um, to get require style um, code management on the client. So you guys are using Clojure, and I'm I'm ignorant about Clojure. So the the basic question is: is that comparable to the system that we've evolved? Roughly, yes. Okay. Um, you know, the, I think the, the, so, you know, Clojure basically has this notion of, all right, this file provides, you know, a particular object in a namespace, and then many different other things can require um, that object within that namespace. And then, you know, when you actually compile this whole thing, it does a topological sort on all these provides and requires, figures out what, you know, what order things need to go in, and, and it generates, you know, a module, uh, usually a monolithic module unless you do something um, heroic, um, and that's what gets sent to the server. Some of these other things out there, like require.js, um, have a bit more support for, you know, um, having sub-modules and being able to load certain things asynchronously in the client rather than providing a uh, monolithic module from the server. Um, but broadly speaking, we're doing the same thing. Um, Br Browserify is very close to how Clojure does the dependency man man management. And uh, unlike Require.js, like Require.js is very different from Browserify. Although Require.js yeah. can actually do the same thing. It can do the topological sort and give you that monolithic. Yeah, but, but you have this closure that you have to work with and you have to use the tools if, if you uh, want to it's different model. Yeah. It's a different model. Um, as a follow-up question to that, we've been kind of struggling to find a way to incorporate that kind of like a build system 
into our Angular um, applications, we've been trying to walk this line of you know how much code lives outside of the Angular framework and gets imported by this build step versus not. Is that, is that a, something that you guys have had to try to figure out as well? What do you mean by outside the Angular framework? Um, so uh, how do I describe this quickly? So we're re representing a lot of our models in state inside of closures that get required inside of a um, an Angular controller, for example. Mm -hmm. I mean, for us, everything, I mean, there's very few things that are outside that main bundle, that main module. Um, and basically, it's, it's things that don't compile well uh, under closure compiler. So for example, jQuery is from a CDN, Angular JS is from a CDN. Um, I think uh, underscore is also um, you know, outside, but everything else is compiled into a single module because we get the benefits by, by you know, closure compiler will you know, drop out things that aren't used and do, and do um, you know, minification across a, a broader uh, translation unit, and that's beneficial. So to the extent that we could throw everything in together in one bundle, we would. It's just some things don't play well within uh, closure compiler. Yeah, great. Thank you. Hi, this is kind of a follow-up to a previous thing. Uh, question is, I'm relatively new, so let me know if this ex currently exists in Angular. It might exist in the future, or my question is just nonsensical. But if you have a button that, like for instance, uh, you know, has an, a, an on-click type event, is there a way, and it's going to instantiate a number of complicated actions? to have it uh, send this event to numerous diff uh, controllers so that they can then execute different directives that make manipulations to the DOM? Uh, well, so the first thing is there is not usually uh, more than one controller going at one time in a route unless there's like sub-child controllers. Is that fair to say? Could, but it's not common. Yeah. So what we're really talking about is like maybe I have multiple directives that all want to you know react to the same event. In other words, you know maybe I've got you know five different graphs all on the screen that are tied. Well, to the let same. me give you an example. Suppose you have just like a number of windows you want. You have one controller that's going to close one window, another controller that's going to open another window, and you could have any number of these you know windows within a windowing system. You work in financial services. Um, no, because that but sounds like a very up. financial services type solution. Um, uh, I mean, the, the key thing is again, is that you have to represent all those window states in a model somewhere or in a service, um, you know, where that state exists. But essentially, you know, somewhere you have to externalize the state of this window is open, it has this position, this window is closed. Um, and essentially, you know, if that button is is manipulating window states, what it's really doing is manipulating that that model representation of all these windows, and those windows basically just watch you know, for changes to that state and react accordingly. Okay, because, yeah, I come from a Flex background, and they always had to add various packages such as Parsley or uh, Robot Legs and stuff like that to, to handle those type of situations. So um, I, I don't know. It's in my work. It, it's, uh, it's come up frequently. It's uh, Okay, thanks a lot for the answer. Do you have any local questions? Now that you've been playing with Angular JS for a year and a half, is it? Um, what would you have told the team, uh, the Angular team, when you first started? Now that you know so much about it, what would you have changed when you first start? Now that you know. Wow. Um, you know, so much, I mean, it's, it sounds kind of thick-headed, but like so much of what Angular is today is because of a long protracted conversation between our two teams. Um, there's a lot of features in AngularJS that are sort of directly evolved from, you know, DFA kind of stretching the bounds of what Angular has. Much of what we have today um, is pretty much what I would have said back then. Um, I, I, you know, we continue to struggle around how do we manage the, the complexity, you know, of the th of the application. But in terms of functionality and features and flexibility, I mean, I think it's it's pretty much what we what we wanted um, from the beginning. I would love for you guys to open source your stuff. 
I would too. <laughs> Any remote question? questions? One. Yeah, thank All you. Right. I have a really dumb one. Okay. okay, a really dumb one, beginner question. Okay. Um, you had talked about moving a lot of the logic out of the controllers into the models. Yep. But if you're getting like dumb data from the server, what's the right best place to do that, or how do you do that? Like, uh, there's this method called extend, and it's your friend. So okay. what you can do is you get that dumb object from um, from the server, and then you just simply extend it. This is like a mix-in model yeah. with another object that you know uh, has a lot of behavior on it. Um, the other thing you can do, of course, is like there's other ways of converting that thing into you know a richer object that has behavior. Do you just map extend it? You have an array of whatever products, and you just want to add, just map it across all that stuff. Absolutely. Okay, great. Uh, one of the things that, we, that I was talking about with uh, Mishko and some of my engineers uh, over the past few weeks, um, you know, we historically have used the resource service, um, um, but there's a lot of instances where you want to actually control the transformation of how things come on the wire to how things actually are exposed as models. And ultimately, the best solution for that, not that we fully implemented it ourselves, is to write custom resources and not use the resource service. Um, and those custom resources can do protocol transformations. And this is another area where you know you know you don't have to do a map reduce. You just when you do you know book dot get, you know at that moment where you receive the wire you know JSON, you can extend it right there, and then that, that's the model that's appeared. And then again, in the reverse, you can you know strip off that, all that extra you know code when you, when you do the click. Thank you, Mark, very much. Um, Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody.